Mix presents Sound for Film and Television. Welcome to the Composer's Lounge. I'm Lily Moayeri, one of Mix's regular contributors. We have the wonderful Dr. Laura Cartman with us, who has over 30 years of scoring experience in film and television, as well as being the founder of the Alliance for Women Film Composers and a governor of the music branch of the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Very, very excited to have you. Um, so you have double nominations this year for her work. You. you have yeah. double nominations this year for your work on uh, the Essential Discovery Channel docuseries, Why We Hate. Mm -hmm. uh, this is produced by Steven Spielberg and Alex Gibney, who's a longtime documentarian. Um, one of the nominations is for main title theme, and the other one is for, okay, I'm gonna try and say this, outstanding music composition for a documentary series or special. Original That's right. Work. Yeah. <laughs> and more, more recently, I'm hooked on your Lovecraft work. Uh, oh, well, thanks. Raphael Sadiq's, yeah. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Uh, congratulations on everything. Let's okay. talk a little bit about these last couple of projects you've been on. There's a lot right. of things I want to talk to you about. Um, let's talk about your working relationship with Raphael Sadiq. I'm mainly bringing this up because you've done so many different projects with him. And yeah. as you and I, you know, I'm a fan of his and I profiled him for the magazine for his last album. Tell us about your dynamic and how the working process works between you two. Well, that, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a really exciting dynamic. Um, basically, look, I met Ray, uh, we were, he was uh, doing songs for Black Nativity, which was directed by Casey Lemons, who was an old friend of mine. Uh, Casey works with Terrence Blanchard, it, it, and he's, of course, a great friend and a fabulous musician. He was unavailable for this particular job, so um, she reached out to me and had said that Raphael wanted try, to try co-scoring, and I thought that was a really cool idea because I was a big fan of his stuff, too. And I thought we could do some really cool stuff together. And, you know, I look for situations where I feel like I can learn, you know? And what's so ironic is that Raphael calls me the professor, you know, he, because I teach at USC, but also because, you know, I taught him how to score, which by the way, isn't true, but okay. Um, so we started working on, um, on Black Nativity together and we just had a great time. And I don't, you know, Raphael comes from Oakland. He comes from, um, you know, the church and making music. I come from, you know, West LA. I, I have a graduate degree from Juilliard. You know, it's not like we hung out with the same crowd. You know what I mean? And yet there's some way in which we connect on a really, um, a really deep level. We, we have a tremendous amount of respect for each other. Um, we know what the other person can do. And then we swap sometimes, you know, like just when you think, you know, he's done a beat, I've done the beat. And just when you think I've done the arrangement, you know, that's, that's more sort of orchestral, he's done it. But for, you know, so every single project has a different ask. And this one is unique. I mean, every single one is unique, but this one is really unique for two reasons. First of all, because the show is so, is so, so many styles and so many kind of every episode is, is a movie from a different genre. So there are a lot of different kinds of things that one has to do. And the other is, is that, um, you know, we couldn't be together. So we had to change that. Whereas we like to sit in a room together. Um, we couldn't do that this time. So we kind of split, split stuff and then we would kind of work on top of each other's uh, material as well. That's the really kind of short-ish answer, but um, I can the, the thing that I can tell you, and I don't know if other people, if you've interviewed other people who work with Raphael, or even if he's told you himself, but Raphael is somebody who composes with an instrument. So whereas, like for me, you know, with a ton of education and a ton of understanding of the orchestra and various instruments, Ray picks up an instrument and that particular instrument will speak to him, which is so beautiful and so inspiring 
for me. And so he'll come over and he'll sit down and play my piano and he'll play my piano differently than he plays his piano or he leaves five guitars at my house. And every once in a while, like I'll pick up something like a funny thing that I think he might like playing. Like I got this U bass, you know, those ukulele basses. Yeah. with the thick and I thought oh Ray's gonna love this and and he did you know so it's like it's like he it's like a toy for him but I also think it really inspires him and gets him going mm -hmm. which was you know as I said not really the case with Lovecraft but is a beautiful part of working with him it's interesting because I feel like he's very um he doesn't understand how great he is with different things yeah uh, he's excited by new things but he doesn't think he's necessarily the best at them. And it's just like, it's not about best, it's about the uniqueness. And I think that's why the combination with you two is a unique, unique thing in its own right. Um, speaking well, of I'll tell, let, me, I'll, let me just jump in and say one little thing about that. So at the beginning of episode 101 at Lovecraft, I called him and I said, I need you to go to your drum set and just play a solo. I said, uh, he said, I'm gonna bring in my guy. I said, you're not gonna bring in your guy. I said, I want you to go to the drum set and, and play a solo because he is, um, he's a really cool drummer. Like all the Solange stuff, mm -hmm. you know, all, like the, the songs that he did for Solange on that album, that's him on drums. And you can tell because it's just like, it's, it's a, he, he'll play it and then he looped it. And they're funny, they're odd. Like if you listen to the way the kick and the, and the snare work together, it's not traditional drum playing. And that's what I love about it. So he went and he played the solo and that solo became what amped up a lot of the material um, for the sheriff for, for some of the chase scenes, pre monsters. I rewatched that this morning and I was like, you know, it's just, it's, it's very difficult to watch. It was hard to watch it the first time just for the racial component. It's so much harder to watch it the second time because you know what's coming. I know. <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> it's not good. You had a very unique situation with Lovecraft where you couldn't record um, the entire orchestra at the same time, which is what you've been used to. Mm -hmm. And you found a very special work around that that I want you to tell us about that tackled this issue. Yeah, well, I'll be, I'll be super honest with you. You know, to get to record with an orchestra is an opportunity that I, I ex excel at and have had too infrequently in my career. Um, and when I say that, it just means that I haven't had the budgets. And we can talk about that and how it relates to be a woman composer and all of that. But that's, that's another conversation. But how it relates to this is that so we get the HBO show, we get the budget, <laughs> and then there's an effing pandemic, and I can't record that. It's like, are you kidding me? You know, are you kidding me? So, um, and it was like, you know, probably that second week of March, that, that weekend, like around the 14th or in there somewhere. And uh, we, were, we were taking the dog out for a walk and I turned to Nora, who's my, my spouse and a wonderful composer and great orchestrator, conductor, everything, really top-notch musician and, and, and engineer. And um, I said, I think we should start an orchestra. And she said, what are you talking about? I said, I think we should do an online orchestra. But, you know, we have to do an online orchestra. And then I called Lisa Liu, who is um, a really dear friend of ours. She went to Juilliard with Nora. She's a great violinist. And she's a real tastemaker in terms of choosing musicians. And I called Lisa and I said, can we do an online orchestra? And she said, hell yes. And then I called Brad Hanel, who is the engineer um, that, I, that we met on Black Nativity. And Brad is like, he's a, an exceedingly kind of creative mixer. Like he adds... There are two kinds of, I mean, there are 5,000 times the scoring mixers, but, but he's the kind that really adds something. You know, he brings himself into a mix. It, it's not just kind of a reproduction of what you hear. It's, a, it's, got a t it's got a thing to it. I can't describe it, but it's, it's really good. And um, I said to Brad, Could, can we even do this? And he said, I, I think we can, I think we can. And so we started Zooming um, 
with players and Lisa identified some people who either had recording setups or who were willing to dive in. And we did it. I sent out a test queue, which I had written and was approved for, for um, it was the family theme, the very first family theme. Oh, right. um, and it was, it's simple. It's just strings, piano and oboe. And for me, I wanted to hear the blend of the strings because I wasn't worried about the woodwinds and I wasn't worried about the brass, but I was worried about the strings. And it came back, it sounded great. And I thought, oh my God, we can do this. So we did sort of additional Zooms and we, we worked with that. And basically Brad devised a system where he really did the mic placement with the musicians and did it so specifically. So it really, it, it was really, you know, polarities, like where you're sitting in a room, what position are you playing in the orchestra? Um, you know, this idea about switching up violinists and you know it, it was we, we developed a system a system for session prep um for what would go out to the musicians and then what would come back in who would deal with what came back in and then at what point it would go to brad so you know where you see the bloat it's not quite the right word but it's the one that comes to mind is in that part of the process right you, you know you, you everybody's in their own space so the, the the process lives or dies on not only the musicians that you have and how well they record themselves, but then the importing of that, the placing of that, the repairing of it, the, the fixing the timing and doing all of that kind of stuff. And then, um, and then the mixing of it. Um, so it, and it works. And I think, I, and I, I told you this when we spoke before, when I first heard the mixes, the first group of mixes come back, because you gotta remember, I didn't produce these sessions, right? So you gotta put your ego away as a composer. I'm not conducting, I'm not producing, I'm relying on other people to do all of that. So you've gotta say, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna let go of that. And so orchestration became very important, really looking at the scores, really making sure that every intention was in them. Um, and, and then when we, when we heard the scores come back for 101, it was really fascinating because it sounded to me like it was like Bernard Herrmann or Jerry Goldsmith, like this late 50s, early 60s recording, which was, I want to say that I'm a genius and it was totally intentional because of the, the setting of the show, but it wasn't, it just happened. And I would only record the show this way, even God willing, when this thing goes, I think this is, a, there's something about recording it like this that gives it a unique sound that I love for this particular show. Right. I was going to ask you if you would record again in this way, but you just answered my question because yeah. it's very specific to Lovecraft's time period, which if you don't know is the fifties in the U S and uh, there's a lot of there. It's very um, accurate in its time period and all it's sorts odd of because I'm just writing, I'm just writing my thing, right? It's just the way it, it got recorded. It's not just the way it, it, it is the way it got recorded, but what that does is, is explode my aesthetic, mm -hmm. right? If I go look at furniture sites or scroll through my Instagram, everything is mid-century modern. I'm interested in that period. I'm interested in the way that here, here's my, my brand new, you know, <laughs> or, or here, this, here, can you see the, yeah, the lamps. Yeah. Right. So I'm, I'm interested in, in that aesthetic and I'm interested in music from that time as well. I'm interested in film scores from that time. I'm interested in concert music from that time. It's what I grew up listening to. It's my zero. So it's, it's a comfort zone for me, you know, and it's, it's like, I don't know, for a long time I thought about how do I, def you know, people ask what kind of composer you are, you know, it's kind of a crazy question, almost impossible to answer. Um, but I think I'm kind of new old school. <laughs> I love that. I think that's probably the most accurate description. <laughs> and it's great. You know, maybe that's why we, why we get, why we get along because he's new old school too. He takes an old school sound and he, makes it new 
and that's his that's his his aesthetic you know there's also uh the source music is also both 50s and current and not necessarily current or 50s right. like the more i listen really carefully i'm just like well that's kind of a seven that's a 70s song but it's working yeah. so there's no specific time period to the source music yet the score, all the different songs, everything just blends together really nicely. And um, it's very hard to make that happen. And I wanted to ask you how you make your score work with the needle drops. Um, a, couple, a couple of explanations for that. First of all, Misha Green, who's the showrunner, who's the creator, um, who's the heart and soul of this thing. Um, she loves music. I mean, she loves music and she understands, you know, uh, the power of music and film. And she wants to use that. She wants those tools sharpened to the, to the maximum. And she's willing to try all different things and experiment with all different things, you know, uh, what that means. Is it Sarah Vaughan? Is it, is it uh, Leontine Price? You know, is it, does it need to be a classic sound of that time? How does that work with the character? Does it work with Montrose? Does it work with, you know, with Letty and all of this? So that, that's me, that's Misha. Um, when I was brought on to Black Nativity, it, that was a musical, basically a brand new musical. Um, it was um, La La Land before La La Land. And I wish they would re-release it and it's director <laughs> cut because it was brilliant. But anyway, um, I was brought on because when you are experiencing a new musical, well, let, let me back up. There is this odd tacit agreement between a composer and an audience of film music, right? And the odd tacit agreement is that you expect music to happen. Now it's weird. Why in a conversation with, a, you know, a, a Letty and, 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 and George and Atticus would a music cue start? It wouldn't, it's not real life, right? But an audience expects that. There's no issue with that, okay? But when people start singing on camera, that's a problem, right, for a lot of people. So a lot of what I had to do in Black Nativity was take the songs and really weave your way into them. So when the singing happened, it wasn't unexpected, okay? Um, and I think that, that that experience of having worked with songs and, and even producing them to a certain extent, I mean, not producing them like away from Raphael, but taking the material, adapting it to picture and getting in and out of certain things, okay? Um, that really got me working with how do you work with existing songs? And there are a number of ways. I mean, first of all, you pay attention to the key of the song and you can get in and out of anything that way, especially with a related key or the same key. Um, and also tempo, and you can layer on top of it and, you know, and, and, create almost an addition to the song. There's one where the song started and it needed to carry a scene. And when that song starts, it feels great, right? But then you need something to elevate it. And so you don't want to cross a straight up score. In that case, I just layered on top of it and sort of put an orchestra behind the existing song, mapped out the tempo, got it, and then wrote around it. Also wanted to give you a chance to tell us more about the Alliance for Women Film Composers. Um, it's only, as somebody who writes about film music, not exclusively, but I do do quite a few composers every year, talk to very, very few women, and it's only in the very recent years that women are even brought to me, um, which makes me excited, but it may, like I was wondering, oh, was I just not hearing about them before, or... And then when I looked at your credits, I was like, she's been doing this for over 30 years. She's, she's yeah, well, we don't talk about years, really. <laughs> I, yes, it's been, it's been a good 10. No, I'm proud of how long. I, listen, uh, you know, I'm proud of that. I'm very proud of that. Okay, I'll tell you another, the, the true story. Mm -hmm. um, when I started out, and I think as, as many young women, women do, and appropriately so, I thought that everything was going to be open for me. I mean, you know, everybody, the second wave feminists had done their work and, you know, I was at Juilliard and I, 
I've won him prizes and everything was going really swimmingly well. And then I went to um, the Sundance Institute and I never wanted to be a film composer. I grew up in LA. I wanted to be like a professor and a concert music composer. And my dad would always say, you should write music for film. And I wanted to be an intellectual, you know, so I would just kind of like say, no, dad, you're crazy. Anyway, I wound up at Sundance nominated by my very erudite um, uh, professor at Juilliard, my teacher. And I loved it. I fell in love. I just thought it was great. I loved the melding of drama and music. I, I realized that I'd always been attracted to it and that I had never really, you know, I'd been attracted to opera and stage, writing music for stage. And I had not really thought it through in the way. And um, at Sundance, the kind of language that was used, and this is like the late 80s, was the guys this, the guys that. And, and there was, my first agent was there at the time and he, and he came up to me afterwards. He said, why didn't you ask any questions? I said, because it feels like there's no room for me. And it wasn't me being like bitchy feminist because I wasn't, I didn't, you know, I just thought, okay, this isn't going to be a good fit for me. And he said, call me when you come to LA. But the other thing that happened is Shirley Walker was there. Do you know who she was? No. Okay. So Shirley Walker was the first woman to score a studio film and she if you interview Danny Elfman, ask him who Shirley Walker was. Okay. <laughs> he really helped make his sound. Okay. She worked straight up for him. And um, she was at Sundance, but she was there as the wife of Don, the tech guy. And she was a great musician, great conductor, and great orchestrator, and great composer. And she took me under her wing um, in a subtle way. And so I came out to LA and I, and I, Tried. So that's, I mean, that's, you asked about the alliance, but all this leads up to it. Yeah. For years, I would be asked about the woman question and I would ignore it or say, I don't feel it. But I started noticing after I'd been doing it for about 10 years that my male counterparts who were doing exactly the same work, like I did, you know, Sandlot 2 and he did Dr. Doolittle 2. Well, that would lead to a studio movie and mine would. So the first thing you do is you say, I suck or whatever. But I, I actually knew that I didn't suck. I knew that I was good. And I started noticing that, like, I did this job for Spielberg in 2002 called Taken. It was a massive show. I got a lot of attention. Every agent in town called me. And then it didn't lead to anything. Like, like everything felt like a period. There was no bounce. And I saw the guys and they bounced. And it was like, what is going on here? And I still wasn't willing to admit that there was institutional sexism. I just thought, how could this be? We're living in the 21st century in Southern California. Um, and we would go to the BMI dinners and see the other women composers. And one of them was a good friend of mine, but everybody else you'd be sort of vaguely suspicious of because that's also how we were trained, right? If there's one crumb given to you and you all have to split it, you know, you're going to fight each other for Not it. Not very nice about it. And so, you know, things went on and I met Nora um, and she's 20 years my junior and is an excellent composer. And, you know, she wanted to get into scoring and she was living in New York at the time she moved to LA. And I really thought that there were fewer opportunities for her starting out than there were for me, even when I was starting out. Cause I got started in TV movies and there were, you know, four networks that were making TV movies and there was a lot of work. And I started thinking, what are we going to do about this thing? And then a remarkable thing happened. In 2013, um, Martha Loutson included composers in her um, uh, statistics of the top 250 box office films. And women composers were at um, 2%. The lowest of, lower than directors, lower than cinematographers. Low. <laughs> really low. And... I thought, well, let's just do this. So I called up one of those women that I stared at in the corner, who has now become one of my dearest friends. And I said, I think we need to start something. Let's just do a concert. And sure, she was, um, she was uh, Shirley Walker was her mentor. 
Lolita Ritmanis. And um, Lolita has been very successful working with two male partners, doing every like cartoon for years and years and years, making big bang royalties, everything, put all our kids through college, husband works with her. I mean, really successful. You've never heard of her either. Right? I actually did because I looked her up after I talked to you. Yeah, <laughs> so there you go. But very, very successful person, you know, person of wealth and success, right? So, um, but you're and, right. I don't know her like I know John William. I don't know no, her. You wouldn't, you wouldn't know her. But not you, my house. She's not my household name, but she is now. Right, right, we're right. So, um, so we talked and so we decided we would just do this concert. And then there, we found that there was this real need for advocacy. Like, like, like every time we would have kind of a group meeting with people, everybody said, but what are we doing? What are we doing? And so, and the, con and, you know, the concert seemed kind of, less and less important, although we eventually did do it. The first thing that we did was put together a list, a directory of women composers, because the question is, why are we so invisible? Like, we've always been around. Lolita's been working for 30 years. Miriam Cutler's been working for 30 years. I can go on and on. Catherine Bostick, Jermaine Franco. I mean, you know, Heather McIntosh now probably has been at it for 15 years. I mean, I can keep going. But you've never heard of them. And so um, we did this directory and there were Debbie Lurie, there were like 20 of us in it. And now we have probably 650. <laughs> That's so, cool. But the directory, isn't that the most a simple first step, honestly? It's just like, it's you know, here's, like the, here's a list. It's simple first step, but it's utterly radical. Yeah. Because basically it says we exist and we deserve to be counted. And whenever you say there are no women composers, it's just a lie. It's a fiction. And it always has been. Now, do we have a problem with harassment? Yes. Do we have a problem with the pipeline? Yes. Do we have a problem with women not getting accepted in the top institutions? Yes. Do we have a problem with them getting harassed once they get to those institutions? Yes. Um, but they're there. And um, so, the, uh, you know, I became, I started the Alliance. I said, we want to grow bigger than imaginable in five years and be gone in 10. And we're at year six. Um, and I applied to the Motion Picture Academy basically on a lark I never thought I would get in. It's 2015. I was ready to just stir up like all kinds of shit if I didn't get in, right? <laughs> and I got in. You know? I was like, what? And so and that was like, that took the, the wind out of my sails. And then I met with the wonderful uh, Lorenzo Munoz, who was, um, who's just leaving there now and going to Amazon, but she's the head of uh, membership and administration. At that point, it was called membership and governance and awards. And she said, you should run for governor. And I said, oh, come on, you're crazy. And she said, no, you should do it. It's an open seat. And I ran and 20 people ran against me, including like baby face, like people like that. And I won. And I, I, won, I won because of the advocacy work. And I tell you, I, when I was in my first executive committee meeting before I became governor, and I was able to get 20 women in that year. And remember, when I was admitted to the academy in 2015, I was the first woman admitted in 20 years and I was the first American woman composer admitted to the Academy, only Ann Dudley and Rachel Portman before me. And so we've changed all that. It's and well, but this is why you, this is why you haven't, because this pervasive invisibility is part of the problem. Like I'm on a hit show right now and I have two Emmy nominations, but this is my 15th Emmy nomination. I have four. Did you know that? Yes. <laughs> so it's like, I got four, you know? We got a Grammy sitting around the house, you know? So it's like, it's not like I haven't done anything. And it's not even like I haven't been appreciated, but just people, people say to me, well, gee, how come we've never worked together? And it's like, because of this crap. And we are slaying it now. I think, look, Stacey Smith's numbers just came out. So for 2019, top 100 films was the top year we've ever had and there were six uh, we're five percent of the top 100 films so that's up from two percent it's still abysmal okay 
Um, so we have a lot more work to do. Um, but I think that we're that a lot of us are on lists more. Um, work is coming easier. It's not so crazy. It's not so hard to get, you know. Is it, um, two questions. One, um, you said you're hoping to be gone in 10 years because there won't be a need for you. Is that the reason? Yeah. Okay. We so want to stop talking well, about this. Yeah, we want to stop talking about this. Four more years, hopefully there won't be a need to keep pushing and advocating because it'll become more normal. That's I a, think it's going to take more than that. I do, th I do too, but um, yeah. I like it that that's the goal. I like it yeah. as the goal is to actually reach a point that you thought existed before, which is it doesn't it's matter if you're and it's yeah. not going to be a cave. And right. that, that would be, if I were to start something, an alliance for women of some kind, it would be to not have one. It would that's be right. to go cave. I love that idea. Um, thank you so much for all your insight. Thank you for joining us. Is that it? <laughs> yeah.